I'm happy to be here today to present some of my uh, most recent findings and studies that I've done on the 1st New Jersey Brigade at the Battle of Bull Run Bridge, uh, right in Manassas Park here within Prince William County. Uh, so this presentation, uh, it's going to really be from the perspective solely of the New Jerseyans who fought here. It was a terrible day for them. They lose about 337 men, outnumbered about 9,000 to 1,200 as they're assaulting earthworks outside of Manassas Junction here, manned by troops under Stonewall Jackson. Um, prior to doing a lot of the research, the reading that I've done on the Jer Jersey Brigade at Bowen Bridge, a lot of the secondary sources have had brief descriptions of this. You know, it's just a small battle that takes place before the much larger battle begins the next day, the Battle of Second Manassas. Um, so in a lot of the it's, uh, primary sources that have been used are simply official record um, accounts, usually Stonewall Jackson's report, A.P. Hill's report, uh, who commanded the division in his wing, um, as well as some military memoirs done by an artillerist named William Pogue, who commanded an artillery battery, the Rockbridge Artillery, at the Battle of Bowen Bridge. But I always wondered, well, you know, the New Jerseyans are the ones doing the attacking. They're the one getting the brunt of this action. So what did they have to say about it? And for them, too, it was really difficult to try to find detailed accounts of their experiences. So I was going through a lot of um, old newspapers, uh, even dating all the way up uh, as recent as 1912 and beyond, uh, of troops reflecting on this moment where Stonewall Jackson almost bagged them entirely. Um, so going through uh, this account, I'm going to, especially when we get to the battle itself, I'm going to try to let the soldiers who experienced it speak more so than myself. So there will be a lot of quotations, so bear with me. So a very brief history of the 1st New Jersey Brigade, just so you can get a sense of who they are, where they're from. The 1st New Jersey Brigade was made up in the early stages of the war, the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th New Jersey Infantry. Uh, the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd were formed um, right after Lincoln's initial call for volunteers. So in fact, at the 1st Battle of Manassas, uh, the 1st and 2nd Regiment are lightly involved in it. They were part of a division of troops under Theodore Runyon, who were mostly left behind to guard the railroad, while the rest of the Union Army went forward towards Manassas Junction. The 1st New Jersey will be ordered forward at the end of the day towards Centerville, where they will be caught up in that route of the Union Army there. Uh, it will be ordered to try to stem the retreat of these men, but they are unable to do so and are swept away as well with them, but have the honor, or at least they think they had the honor, of being the last Union regiment um, back towards the, it, that get back to uh, the defenses of Washington. So the last ones to leave the field. The 4th New Jersey Regiment for, uh, joins them afterwards and were actually consolidated into what's known as the New Jersey Brigade. Their first commander will be uh, General Philip Carney, who is a New Jersey native. He is a uh, pre-war military man. By then, he was already decorated. Most people in the Army knew who he was. He's a staunch disciplinarian, and he whips the New Jersey boys into shape, uh, usually referring to them as his pets or his band of thieves. But later on, Carney is eventually going to be promoted to division command outside of the Union 6th Corps that the 1st Brigade is part of. So they will be then put under the command of another man, Major General, or excuse me, Brigadier General George W. Taylor, who is Hunter in County, New Jersey's only general. Before we get to him, to point out, if you're interested in demographics, where men are from, uh, here are the counties in New Jersey, broken down by each regiment. I am from area near here in Somerset County, New Jersey. That's where I was born and raised, and um, family still all lives up in this area. And that's Somerville there is actually where I graduated from high school. But uh, over here in Hunterdon County, as I just mentioned, George Taylor is going to be the only general from this county, and he's actually buried only a stone's throw away from uh, where my mom lives currently. So I was very familiar with him. Starting a job here down in Prince William County, uh, it really, uh, opened up even more of my interest in learning more about him and what the men in the New Jersey Brigade did here at Bull Run Bridge. So here is George Taylor. 
Uh, he was born in November of 18, or 1808 in what is today Highbridge, New Jersey. He graduated from a private military academy in Middletown, Connecticut, that was actually founded by Alden Partridge, who founded a whole bunch of military academies throughout the United States, and he even was the founder of Norwich University, where I got my master's from. So that was a pretty cool link. Uh, he did see active service in the Navy, and then during the Mexican-American War, he was commissioned a captain in the 10th U.S. Infantry and saw significant service, where he made a lot of his uh, pre-war friendships that would continue into the Civil War. Uh, afterwards, he joined his father's business at the Taylor Wharton Iron and Steel Works, which is actually, it's right there in Highbridge, it is the oldest operating iron foundry in the entire United States. It was opened in 1742 and still to this day continues its service as a steel works. Uh, after his, brother, or his father died in 1860, him and his brother Lewis inherited the company. Lewis is the one who will grow the foundry even more, uh, and that's the Taylor in the Taylor Wharton Steelworks name uh, that, the, that it's named after. At the outbreak of the Civil War, he's going to initially be commissioned as the commander of the 3rd New Jersey Volunteers, and as I mentioned, Carney is going to be elevated to division command, and he will assume command in uh, March of 1862. His son Archibald is on his staff, and his nephew, another Archibald Taylor, uh, is also serving as a captain of the 3rd New Jersey as well. And Taylor is going to lead his men through the uh, Seven Days Battle on the, in the Peninsula Campaign. At the Battle of Gaines Mill in June of 1862, the New Jersey Brigade is going to lose almost 1,100 men. It's a terrible battle for them. The 4th New Jersey itself is surrounded and nearly captured to a man. But they will be paroled, and most of them will be back here by the Battle of Bull Run Bridge. This is General Taylor's boyhood home, which still stands today in Highbridge, New Jersey. This is the old um, original home that was built on the Iron Works property. It's known as Solitude. And it belongs to Highbridge, and just I saw the other day, um, last year, they actually received a grant to begin rehabilitation of it. Uh, so this home will be preserved. But Taylor, once he does, uh, him and his brother do inherit the business, uh, Taylor himself is going to go more into farming and will purchase a farm about a mile or so outside of Highbridge in Clinton, New Jersey today. So his brother will manage the more day-to-day -day operations of the family company. But before we get to Bowen Bridge, it's always important to ask, well, why the heck were these guys here in the first place? Context is important. So, return to Prince William County, the second Manassas campaign. In August of 1862, McClellan's Army of the Potomac has been ousted down near, uh, outside the walls of Richmond. The Peninsula campaign is a failure. McClellan is forced and recalled to have his army travel back up towards Washington, D.C. and Alexandria, Virginia, so from there they could go and rendezvous with a newly created Union Army under General John Pope, that is the Army of Virginia. Uh, by the last weeks of August, both Robert E. Lee, who is in pursuit of John Pope, but will be blocked at the Rappahannock River, these two armies are bogged down and stalemated. On August 24th, Robert E. Lee is going to come up with a plan to try to get John Pope out of these defenses. He will meet with his subordinates, uh, Jeb Stewart, Stonewall Jackson, and James Longstreet, and pitch this plan to have Jackson, followed by Longstreet, go around the flank of Pope, come through the Bull Run Mountains, and then tear up the railroad, his main supply line behind the Union Army here, as well as the connection between the Washington and Alexandria garrisons and Pope. So, this plan will be set in motion the next day, August 25th, Jackson leaves, and by August 26th, he is beyond um, Thoroughfare Gap and moving towards Gainesville. And while he is there, he's going to have a decision to make. He can either continue along the Manassas Gap Railroad and head right towards Manassas Junction, or he can turn southeast on present-day Linton Hall Road and head towards Bristow Station, which he knows is lightly defended. So he's going to choose the latter. And that evening, his men are going to surge down Linton Hall Road, and they are going to uh, push aside and capture the garrison that is at Bristow Station, as well as they get there in time to actually derail and wreck two trains that are passing up uh, through the Bristow Station, heading back towards the Alexandria Railroad. After that success, Jackson is going to find out that the Manassas Junction Supply Depot is also lightly defended, so he is going to have one of his brigade commanders in Richard Ewell's division, Isaac Trimble, with two regiments, 
one from North Carolina, one from Georgia, move down the railroad towards Manassas Junction. In the middle of the night, they're going to ascend or descend upon the garrison there, easily pushing them aside. Union defense is futile. Jeb Stewart's cavalry would be, them, be with them as well. So Manassas Junction is now in Confederate hands. So this is a map from 1862 that shows the Manassas vicinity. And you can see, here's the junction over here, here's the railroad. These are all the fortifications from 1861 that were built the previous year by Confederate soldiers, as well as one fort that still stands today, known as Mayfield Fort. And then another fort over here, known as Fort Bert Beauregard. I'm pointing these out because this will be what is, becomes the Bull Run Bridge battlefield. Here's a modern image of what Fort Beauregard looks like today. This entire area, I should mention now, has been completely developed over. So this presentation uh, also, you know, I'm striving to tell a story of a battle that the battlefield of does not really exist anymore. Fort Mayfield uh, and the Connor House, as well as Bull Run Bridge, are really the only landmarks that uh, exist today that are reminders of this battle that was fought in August 1862. Here's Fort Mayfield, which I did mention is preserved. Um, the fort itself, you can see the earthworks here. On the inside, there are a series of interpretive markers, some that do actually explain the Battle of Bull Run Bridge and provide context. This is a view off of the heights that Mayfield Fort stands on, looking towards the direction about a half mile away from here will eventually be where the Jersey Brigade does make its assault. So they are within easy range of Confederate artillery that will be posted in this fortification. It also shows how this is on high ground. A lot of the Confederate uh, earthworks that surround Manassas Junction to the east are on high ground. And the Jersey Brigade will be coming directly towards them and they will serve the purpose that they were built um, and intended uh, to complete, and that is using high ground to stop any attacks coming against the junction from the east. All right, so this is modern day Bull Run Bridge. You, you all know where Blooms Park is by any chance? It's right along Bull Run, uh, just kind of to the northeast of Manassas Park. And it was an old golf course, but today it is a, there's a library there and there's still are the old golf course uh, pathways leading through it. So you can actually walk to this high ground above uh, the parking lot and then walk down to Bull Run Bridge over top of uh, Bull Run itself. So this is the bridge, what it looks like today. This is the bridge in 1862. In fact, you can see the original abutments do still exist. And there is Confederate graffiti on those uh, abutments from 1861. So this way is looking east. So Manassas Junction is to the other side of the photo. But word of the Bristow Raid and the advance on Manassas Junction reaches General in Chief Henry Halleck and Colonel Herman Haupt, you can see at the bottom left, he's in charge of all the military railroads for the Union Army uh, here in the East. He says uh, the events, uh, learns that the events are progressing and that uh, by 11 p.m. now on August 26, he's going to learn that the engine secretary, which was actually a train that was able to avoid destruction by Jackson's men at Bristow Station, the secretary, after crossing Bull Run Bridge about a quarter mile down the railroad track, is going to run in to another train whose engine had broken down. So now the railroad track is blocked on the east side of Bull Run. So if there's going to be any troops rush forward to try to recapture Manassas Junction or Bristow Station, they're going to have to debark on the opposite side of Bull Run in order to get there by using the crossings over the waterway. So Halp is going to come up with a plan now to send a construction train forward to try to clear the tracks of these derailed trains. And he's, they're, they're going to be accompanied by about three to 4,000 men. Well. Going through the night, around 2 a.m., he's going to find the headquarters of General George Taylor of the New Jersey Brigade, and he's going to recruit Taylor's service as well as two regiments of Ohioans. And by 3 o'clock, Taylor is going to have all of his officers briefed on what their mission is, and by 4 a.m., they're going to march off to uh, Fort Ellsworth along the railroad track, or what they called California Station. They're going to load up onto the trains and begin making their way towards Bull Run. 
So the Joseph Brigade is going to arrive at Bull Run Bridge just before, they stop before that wreckage around 9 a.m. or so. And they're going to get off the trains, march over the tracks, and deploy on high ground. So far they have no, not met any kind of resistance. But you can see the hill on the other side of the tracks that they're going to form up. The first and second brigades are going to form, in, or regiments are going to form into battle line. The first will be on the right, the second will be on the left, and the third regiment is going to form up behind them in the center. The fourth regiment is going to be left behind to guard the railroad bridge, as well as their train on the other side of Bull Run, and wait for the Ohioans to arrive behind them. Taylor does not wait for them to arrive. He immediately sets his men off and moves them up that high ground. All right, so this is a Google map of the Bullhorn Bridge battlefield today. Bullhorn Bridge still exists up here. You can follow the railroad line down how it curves, but Taylor is going to form his men up on the hill here. This is all Bloom's Park, and then he's going to move them in kind of an angle across the tracks through this area here between Euclid and the Centerville Road, and that's when they're finally going to get hit. But there is a piece of high ground here next to the Connor House, which still exists today. Here you can see the Connor House does sit on a significant piece of high ground here. But all that ground that they cross is open at the time of the battle. Today, it's all built over, not much to see. In fact, the hill here that Blooms Park is in is all wooded. At the time, it would have been much more clearer. But they're gonna move across this open field known as the Plains of Manassas. And once they reach the Connor House and that high ground, next to it, that is when they're going to get their first taste of the Confederate defenses that are positioned in front of them. Company C of the 1st New Jersey is going to be deployed as skirmishers about 500 yards in front of the battle line that was initially formed on the heights. So they are the first ones who will be met with some kind of contact. But that main battle line, once they reach that high ground, they come under fire. Uh, I have here, this is a Brief excerpt from an article that was written by J.S. Jones of Company B of the 2nd New Jersey. He's going to remember coming onto the field. He says, quote, Just at that time, there was no music in the air, no visible evidence of troops in the vicinity. There were wood, woods on each side of the track, which the train stopped. The brigade marched forward to the open ground, formed a battle line, and advanced, there being no enemy in sight, except some cavalry to the left of Leek, skirting the timber. Presently, however, as the line advanced, there came out of the stillness in its front volleys of musketry and missiles of shot and shell. Colonel Henry Brown of the 3rd New Jersey is going to remember when the Confederates opened fire on them. He says, after a march of about one and a half miles, if you go to Google Maps, you can literally set destination marks from Bowen Bridge to the Connor House in that area, and that's just a little over one and a half miles. So that's why I think this is where they first come under fire. But after one and a half miles through a rough but open country, we came to a dwelling house, possibly the Connor house. There was also an old plantation nearby known as a Birmingham Green, so it could have been one of the houses outside of there, an outbuilding. Uh, and he said it was the marks of an old camp when suddenly the enemy opened on our right and left flanks with artillery at short range. That artillery is coming from Fort Mayfield as well as near Fort Beauregard. It's at this time that it's recorded that Stonewall Jackson himself, seeing that the New Jersey brigades are sending themselves basically into the jaws of death, he's going to ride out near the left end of the Confederate line and he's going to begin waving a white handkerchief. Now, Stonewall Jackson's shown mercy to Union troops. Don't usually see that too often in the Civil War. But he sees that the Jersey men are about to march to their death. He rides out, waves his white handkerchief, trying to get them to surrender, and immediately a bullet whizzes by his head. <laughs> the actual brigade had not been given orders to fire yet. They haven't even stopped and had time enough to, fire, uh, to you know, shoot their muskets. So I'm thinking this probably comes from one of the men of Company B of the 1st New Jersey in that, that front skirmish line. But needless to say, Jackson gets the message rides back to his men and tells them to hold their fire until the New Jersey Brigade can get as close as possible before they let loose. So this is the 1937 aerial map of this section of Prince William County. And I think this is so cool because this is probably the closest 
you can get of a map depicting what the area at the time may have looked like. Obviously, you can see some more modern homes that had been built here along the Centerville Road. Uh, Bowling Bridge is off in this direction, but here's the railroad. Here's actually Mayfield Fort. And then what's awesome about this is you can also see Fort, Fort Beauregard still standing. So the Confederate line, after these New Jersey troops come into view, the artillery opens fire on these two flanks here, then they stop, and then AP Hill's uh, division of about 9,000 men is gonna be ordered forward by Jackson. And they are gonna take position just on the other side of a slight curvature of heights that exists between Mayfield Fort near, you know, up towards near Fort Beauregard. So they are essentially going to be masked from the New Jersey men as they make their approach. But once they close into within about 300 yards, all of a sudden these Confederate troops come into view, level their muskets, and start opening fire. The New Jersey men have still not been given the order to stop and fire. They are still advancing. Now this is one of the coolest accounts that I was able to find. This is from a 1912 issue of the Courier News in New Jersey. There was a discussion or a presentation on the Panama Canal that apparently was so exciting that it just ended up turning into war veterans swapping their stories. And this man, Samuel McLeod of the Com Company I, 2nd New Jersey, he's going to give a vivid account of his experience uh, to an audience. And he's going to remember, at least that the newspaper records, that, quote, he advanced in line of battle obliquely across the railroad to meet the rebels. They had a crossfire of artillery on us with another battery in the center waiting for us to get up closer. I saw the Reb cavalry, a cavalry going down the railroad on our left to get in the rear. I looked at the general and colonel, but everything was go ahead. I said, boys, our jig is up expecting that we would all be killed or captured. About that time, we got orders to fix bayonets. In doing so, it staggered the line of battle for a moment, but we soon recovered and showed up a line as though on dress parade. I expected to hear the order to charge bayonets, but the order was to about face. That brought me in the rear rank. We had only taken a few paces when I received a sharp crack in the calf of my left leg. No bones were broken, but I could feel because I could walk. All, or because I, or excuse me, no bones were broken that I could feel because I could walk all right. I said, boys, there's one for Mac. Anyhow, I said, anyhow, I said, no sooner that when I received a shot in the side of the head from the direction of the railroad on our right. That shot sent me to grass on one knee. I caught myself on the man next to me and got up. I tell you, the stars did fly and I think I saw them all. It made me wink and blink. I put my hand up to see what damage had been done. I found that it had only plowed the bark up as it was a glance shot. I said, boys, there's two for Mac, and he is going to get up and get, or the third one might put him out. I came near getting the third one on my way out. I heard a commotion overhead. I dropped to the grass, as I always did when there appeared anything in the air overhead. I don't think it went over a foot above my head as it dropped. It hit a fellow in the hind leg who was just ahead of me. He hustled to his stump to sit down to see what had happened to the hind leg. I did not have time to stop to find out. I was hoofing it out of harm's way. I walked on down the railroad until I got to Fairfax Station. So this account is interesting because a lot of the secondary sources that I've read, all the way from the late 19th century up until modern day works, even like um, John Hennessy's Return to Bull Run, they all say that the Jersey Brigade fixed bayonets and charged, charged multiple times some even say, but this account and everything else I've seen is that the New Jersey Brigade never even was ordered to fire a shot. They fix bayonets, and as soon as General Taylor realizes the mess that he has just led them into, he immediately orders them to turn around and get out of there and head back to the bridge. Uh, so finding this account, seeing that, it's one and only that I've actually seen a description of them being ordered to fix bayonets, and then he says that they, he was expecting them to charge, never got the order, and said it was turn around and get out of here. Um, so this mess that Teller had gotten the men, it was not appreciated by a lot of the men under his command, and they really saw it as a blunder. Uh, one man, Robert McCrate, of the First New Jersey, was furious at what had transpired, and later on he's going to write to his brother, I never read or heard tale of such a thing in my life, marching men up on three batteries of artillery without any artillery or cavalry to support them, marching us up like sheep to be slaughtered. If General Taylor had given us an order to charge or to fire, it would have caused some satisfaction. But then marching us up to within 300 yards of their batteries and then marked us right back without giving us any order, 
It was awful. Despite this, Stonewall Jackson, again, he tried to make these men surrender. He gave them a chance. Uh, seeing them now turn around and retreat, he's going to order his Confederates to come over that rise and begin pursuing them, as well as the artillery to, well, limber up, follow those New Jerseyans back to the bridge, and fire every chance you get. So they're going to get so close that they're going to be right on the New Jersey men's back with canister. But Jackson, in his report after the battle, he's going to write that the assault, referring to the New Jersey Brigade, was made with great spirit and determination under a leader worthy of a better cause. So he had a lot of praise for these men. And in fact, in an earlier report that he had written and was not submitted, or he had submitted it and it was censored out, he had actually written that if he had had a whole division of troops such as those, he could take Washington, D.C. Very high praise. So the Jersey men, after being repulsed around the present day Home Depot, between Euclid and uh, Center, Centerville Road, they were going to fall back at an angle being pursued back to the railroad, and then the first and second New Jersey are going to take the railroad back to the bridge, while the third New Jersey is going to try to scramble up this ravine to get over the hill at Blooms Park, down to the bridge itself. So waiting at the other end of Bull Run Bridge, fortunately for them, was the 11th and 12th Ohio, under the command of Colonel E. Parker Scammon. They had arrived probably about a half hour to an hour after the New Jersey men uh, had crossed Bull Run Bridge. Scammon, as he comes off the cart to get his men into position, he's going to write, we had just left the cars when the New Jersey troops came pouring along the track of the railroad in utter disorder, some of them talking of overwhelming numbers of the enemy, some censoring because they were ordered to retreat without firing a gun. I asked the meaning of what I saw and was answered that General Taylor had ordered the troops to move back around a bend of the road to get out of range of enemy cannon. Oh, excuse me. Colonel Brown, commander of the uh, 3rd New Jersey, he's going to remember the retreat back to the bridge. He says, we now came to a ravine. Most likely, oops, that one right there, which still exists today. He says, we now came to a ravine, the declivity of which was so steep that many of the men fell in descending. And in ascending the opposite side, we received a destructive fire from the enemy's artillery at short range. Fatigue of incessant marching over bad roads and continuous fire of the enemy had thinned my ranks. And many men had fallen out, unable to march. The retreat being continued across the bridge, these stragglers were all captured by the enemy. So as the four regiments of the New Jersey Brigade pull past the Ohio men, they're going to form up behind them or in the railroad, and some are just going to continue all the way back uh, towards Fairfax Station. In the process of trying to rally the New Jersey troops with Scammon's men, General Taylor is going to be mortally wounded. He'll be hit in the left leg and carried by a handcart up to Burke Station, which is present-day Burke, Virginia, along the railroad, before being sent to a hospital in Alexandria, Virginia. One of his staff officers uh, said that as the general was being carried off and command was being turned over to Colonel Scammon, the highest ranking officer there, that Taylor is going to be pleading with the men, my God, please prevent another bull run, referring back to the first battle of Manassas and the route of Union troops there. Some of the New Jersey men are able to rally though and remain with Colonel Scammon's troops. And they are gonna form up just, this is actually the high ground here, that the 12th Ohio is going to come forward. And they're not soon, soon enough in position that Confederates are gonna begin trying to go across the bridge and fording above and below to the left and to the right, using things like Blackburn's Ford to get around the flank of the Union troops. But a handful of the men of the 4th New Jersey stay behind. And one of those, a Lieutenant Edward Wright, he's going to write, that we had no artillery and no cavalry, hence we were obliged to retreat fighting our way. As the enemy had by fording the stream above and below us, nearly surrounding us. Many times during the day, I took command of whole regiments. At one time, I rallied with the help of a sergeant, the whole of the 11th Ohio Regiment. Whipped within 10 minutes, double our number of rebels. So for the next five hours or so, Scammon and what's left of the New Jersey Brigade are going to be uh, performing a fighting retreat 
back towards Fairfax Station. They're going to succeed in doing so. And even though uh, the Confederates are going to follow them for about a mile, mile and a half down the railroad, Jackson is going to realize that this victory is won and there's no, there's no sense in pursuing them even farther. So he's going to recall his men back to uh, Manassas Junction. So casualties are pretty stunning for the New Jersey Brigade, 337 to be precise. Nine dead, that's those who were just killed in action that day. Many later it will be found were also dead or had died of their wounds. 124 wounded and 204 missing or captured. And all those 204 men were most likely captured on that hill overlooking Bull Run Bridge, as well as a lot of the wounded too. So another misconception I think with this battle is that the New Jersey troops did stand within that arc of Confederate fortifications and infantrymen and artillery and stand there just to get blasted to pieces. No. As some, most of these accounts I've showed you, showed you today have, have uh, depicted, they got out of there as soon as they realized that they were in a mess. So all of those casualties, or the majority of them at least, I believe takes place during that retreat back to Bull Run Bridge. Most of them struggling to get over the high ground uh, overlooking Bull Run Bridge. But one of the casualties is obviously General George Taylor. He is mortally wounded, and he is brought back to the Mansion House Hospital in Alexandria, Virginia. If you're familiar with Alexandria, this house, or this part of it, does still exist today. Uh, next to it is the Carlisle House. But this was a major Union uh, military hospital facility in Alexandria. And while he is there, he is going to be treated by this man, Dr. John H. Britton. And in the medical and surgical history of the War of the Rebellion, uh, there is a description given of Taylor's, uh, the nature of his wound, uh, the surgical procedure that will take place, and then ultimately his fate. So they're going to write, a ball entered at the inner edge of the tibia, about six inches above the internal malleus. Or mal malleolus. Is there any doctors out there? How do you pronounce that word? It passed directly through and fractured the bone very badly for about six inches above and below, making two openings of exit. The patient was admitted into the Mansion House Hospital, Alexandria, 13 hours after the reception of the injury. That's how long it took for them to get him up the railroad to Alexandria. And uh, the operation for it, which would be an amputation, uh, was performed 26 hours after the reception of the injury, the patient losing considerable blood and all the vessels requiring ligation. He had been with the Army through the Peninsula Campaign, and his blood appeared to be very much vitiated by morbific influence of malaria. So he had been battling malaria on the Peninsula, which did not help his cause. After the amputation, it was discovered uh, what was previously suspected, that the fibula was not broken by the force of the ball, but by the weight of the patient coming upon it suddenly when support from the tibia was destroyed by its fractures. The patient's arterial system did not fully react. His pulse, which was feeble, tremulous, and very irregular at times, evidently denoted a depraved condition of the system. He refused to take stimulants, except sparingly. This condition continued until September 1st, 1862, when he died at 4 o'clock a.m. He was under the influence of chloroform during the operation. So George Teller finally succumbs to his wounds early morning hours of September 1st, 1862. Now, can anyone tell me what other famous Union general is killed that day? Phil Kearney. So the New Jersey Brigade loses two of its brigade commanders in a single day. Kearney, of course, being killed uh, at the Battle of Chantilly, the end of the Second Manassas Campaign. So overall, this is a terrible day for the New Jersey Brigade, but it's something that they do move on from. And the New Jersey Brigade will go on uh, to great laurels throughout the rest of the war, especially uh, during the Overland Campaign in 1864, and they even participate in the breakthrough of the Petersburg Lines, April 2nd, 1865. Uh, one soldier who had experienced the fighting at Bull Run will write September 9th, Company B of the 2nd New Jersey is named Stuart J. Hull, and he's going to write to his family. I have been in one battle since I wrote you before. I didn't get hurt, but I saw many a poor fellow fall by my side, and it made me feel very bad. But it cannot be avoided now. We must fight for our country's cause and to restore our glorious union. Many a poor fellow has fell in his efforts, and I'm afraid 
there will be many more fall before our country is out of danger. And of course, many more did fall several days after Bull, the Battle of Bull Run Bridge. August 28th, 29th, or 30th, over 30, or 20,000, excuse me, men will fall during the Battle of Second Manassas. But this battle, as well as its sister fight, known as the Battle of Kettle Run at Bristow Station the same day, uh, just later in the afternoon, these two battles are going to be probably the most consequential on the entire Second Manassas campaign. Definitely the most consequential day of it. These consequences include, before the action at Bull Run Bridge, the Army of the Potomac under McClellan, their sixth corps that was at Alexandria, which the New Jersey Brigade was part of, had been ordered on the 26th by General in Chief Henry Halleck to go to Gainesville and link up with John Pope. Edwin Sumner's second corps was still in Alexandria as well. They were supposed to rendezvous with Pope. This action at Bull Run is going to give General McClellan you know, the excuse he needs to not send those men forward. And he says, later that day, I learned that Taylor's brigade, sent this morning to Bull Run Bridge, is either cut to pieces or captured, that the force against them had many guns and about 5,000 infantry, receiving reinforcements at every moment. I think our policy now is to make these works perfectly safe and mobilize a couple of corps as soon as possible, but not to advance them until they can have their artillery and cavalry. And those two corps that are mobilized are obviously the 6th Corps and the 2nd Corps. The 6th Corps will not be on the road to meet up with Pope until August 29th. So the uh, second day of the Battle of 2nd Manassas, by then it's going to be too late. Pope is going to be uh, defeated the next day by Robert E. Lee once James Longstreet finally makes a junction um, with Stonewall Jackson. So here is George Taylor's grave outside of the Clinton Presbyterian Church in Clinton, New Jersey. Taylor's remains, after he died in Alexandria, are going to be loaded on a train and sent north to New Jersey. They arrived back home on September 3rd, and his funeral service was scheduled for Saturday, September 6th at 11 a.m. He was taken to his home just outside of Clinton, where he was brought into the parlor. In shutting off the parlor, the undertaker and his assistant prepared the body and dressed it in his full Brigadier General uniform. The remains were then placed in an elegant casket covered with a dark purple velvet and trimmed with silver mountings. The coffin was draped over all with a heavy black lace and the General's battle sword was placed on the lid beside him. The Taylor family parlor was then opened for the family and callers until the funeral on Saturday. In anticipation of a large crowd, they decided to hold the service at Clinton's Presbyterian Church. And that Saturday, the coffin was loaded in a hearse and taken through the streets of Clinton to the churchyard, where it was laid out under a tree for attendees to pay their respects. He was then carried into the church where the service was performed and then buried on the west side of the building, which you can clearly see here. Less than a year later, George's nephew, 21-year-old Captain Archibald Taylor of the 3rd New Jersey, was laid to rest beside him after being killed in action at the Battle of Salem Church on May 3rd, 1863. So a year later, the family has to go through the same kind of service. But I think the best obituary left behind is by the New York Advertiser for General Taylor, which Bowen Bridge is obviously his climactic as well as decisive uh, moment in his service during the Civil War in his entire military career. They are going to say the sum of General Taylor's character may be briefly stated. As a man, he was of rare integrity, self-counselor, and a good friend, father, husband, son, and brother. I should mention he leaves behind eight children. As a citizen, he was public-spirited and of the purest patriotism. As a soldier, he was surpassed by men in ardent valor and by few in skill. No imputations have ever been cast upon either his courage or his military conduct. And in his death, his state mourns the loss of one of her pure citizens best patriots and bravest sons. So just like the Battle of Bull Run Bridge is overshadowed by the subsequent Battle of Second Manassas, so too George Taylor's death was overshadowed because all the newspapers were reporting on Philip Carney's death. So it's very rare to find an actual obituary for General Taylor. But then the presentation, I think it's fitting to post the names of the other men 
who weren't memorialized. Men who died of killed in action or later died from the wounds that they received August 27th. So that number I said of nine who were killed in action, it gets up to uh, somewhere near 30. So the men who died, most of these men are now buried uh, in Arlington National Cemetery. And thank you. <laughs> Questions? Um, Where did Jackson stop his, his I've read about a mile to a mile and a half down the railroad, or I guess that'd be up the railroad. Up the That's road. as far as they advance. And it's, it's the cal cavalry that goes forward. Because uh, Pender's Brigade, as well as Archer's Brigade, uh, do go down to the bridge itself, and the cavalry cross or get around the fords on both sides of the Union troops there. And seeing that the, re the retreat was going to be cut off, uh, they either stand and fight and repulse them, or they begin falling back uh, down the, or up the railroad to Fairfax. How far, and how far from Fairfax Station that is, going back towards the battlefield? Um, the, the Jersey men get to Fairfax Station. They get Fairfax. Yeah, they do. And then from there, um, feeling, feeling that they're going to be cut off up the railroad, they then take a circuitous, circuitous route back to Alexandria. So they won't arrive back in Alexandria until 9 a.m. the next morning. Mm. Because they were originally going to go past the railroad and then come back to Burke Station where they were hoping to be picked up by trains like Taylor's remains were earlier, but there was rumors spreading that the Confederates were there. So that forced them to take an even longer back road. Of course, they weren't there at Burke Station, but it, that, there's so much confusion at that point. So, oh. is that, yeah. Is shouldn't they, it doesn't matter. Shouldn't they have sent ahead of them all, like a couple of scouts to see what Yes. Okay. Yeah, no. Um, that really, all that they would have probably had to do was just send forward one regiment, and then they would have been able to assess and see that Jackson was there at Manassas Junction. Because they, they were told that there was probably just some Confederate guerrillas that were there that had raided the junction. So Taylor, um, rather than waiting to assess what was in his front, orders his men forward. So careless, but he had orders to get to Manassas Junction and see what was going on, recapture uh, and salvage what could be saved. I have one more mm -hmm. You mentioned Birmingham Green. Yeah. Today there's the Birmingham. Yes, that's that. That is what. Yep, that is that is where it is. Um, so this map, the topographical map has it, right here. It's where the shopping center says now is where the house was. Mm -hmm. It's where the house was. Yeah, so that's why I'm thinking some of the dwellings that were mentioned, because this is all was at the time, a higher piece of ground. Um, so that... So the dwellings were probably somewhere around here. The yep. Area that it's in. Yep, name, because the Connor house itself, it was owned by a, uh, the Butler family at the time, and it was considered on the property of Birmingham. So I guess they must have paid rent to, to the owners there. Do you have the questions still in the back? Um, I, I was trying to think in terms of the bridge going across and, and going up towards, um, you've got Devereaux Station. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, I mean, basically like Clinton. Did the Confederate troops get that far, do you think? Or Is that? What, it, need a bigger map. Yeah. Yeah, but like I said, I, I've read about a mile, two mile and a half, so somewhere in that general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think they, they did get across the bridge because they also destroyed the, the train um, that had been left behind for the Jerseyans to load up on. Because the, the Jersey men came down on the train, and then the Ohioans came down on the train after that, where they debarked on the other side of Bullrun Bridge. So they were kind of stuck there, which was another reason why they had to go by foot rather than by rail to get back to Alexandria. And then um, that map right there, um, where did you find that map? This, I love uh, this was uh, National Archives, I believe. Yeah. I need to talk to you. Yeah, I can, I can send it to you. It's on there in one of their map collections. Yeah. 
Great. Awesome. Thank you.